is out of this third chapter. I should have read something, but uh, for those of you who may not have been here last Tuesday, particularly the second class, it would be a very good idea to get that tape. Um, I think it might could possibly help you spiritually. Not the piece of plastic with the little thing in it. Because you can get that and you can stick it in a, sh a shelf somewhere or set it down. But I think what the Lord had for us was for us. And it was from the Lord and it was timely. <clears throat> so, Amen. Uh, <clears throat> let's look at uh, John 3, beginning with verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. <clears throat> and uh, we, obviously, the, the big subject of chapter 3 is this conversation between uh, Nicodemus and Jesus. Uh, Nicodemus acknowledging... <clears throat> Jesus as a good good master or good teacher. Jesus or Nicodemus acknowledging Jesus as a miracle worker. Nicodemus honoring him even though he came by night so nobody would spot him uh, as much as he can because he doesn't want to lose his position which is very important to him anyway. Um... And so I'll read a little of my notes since I didn't read anything last time. <clears throat> Nicodemus didn't really understand what Jesus was saying. He at least understood that when Jesus talked about being born again, he was talking about a birth. <clears throat> he, Jesus was talking about a birth. And this concept of uh, a human being born... Uh, on the planet and hearing things about God and say, you know, and, and you hear the, the message of Christ dying for you and by hearing that, something may register in your mind that says that's believable I will believe the basic tenets of a historical event that took place 2,000 years ago that it is possible that this could apply to me and I really don't want to go to hell, so, okay, I'm a believer. Um, this, isn't, this isn't really the kind of belief that God had in mind. He meant to believe and receive. And that is an altogether new birth. Now, it's interesting because, I mean, just, just for interest's sake, how many of you are born again? Raise your hand. Okay? Born again. <clears throat> All right. There cannot be a new birth without first a death. It can't be. I mean, this is the basic thing Jesus was... Written. Now, he didn't get into it right here, but he does get into it in other places. And this is the basic premise that Jesus is saying, you must be born again, meaning that this nature that is within you and this fallen nature that is in here is fallen. It is corrupt. It is... Um, prone to sin. And basically, Jesus is saying this. There must be a death, which is what the cross... You see, it's not just believing there was two pieces of wood. 
because historically there was two pieces of wood. And a, a, a historian can believe that Jesus died on two pieces of wood and not be born again. But it is not just believing that there was an event that took place and somehow miraculously that event did something. It is to believe is to believe in a new birth that not mentally must go through the cross, but spiritually must go through the cross. Spiritually. You must be born again. There must be, before there can be a resurrection into new And that can be all things be are become new. That can be the new man. That can be the new wine. That can be the new birth. That can be because behold, all things have become new. But let me tell you, they are, they're not just new because you believe something and now God goes, whoo, waves his hand and says it's all new. That's not that, the way it is. It is new because there was a death of the old. It's new now. I ask for a show of hands of how many are born again or have experienced the new birth and basically everybody raised their hand, which means something. It means for anything to be new, including new birth, you had to go through death. Now some of you are trying to figure out what this go through death thing is all about. Some of you are trying to die. Some of you are trying to get hold of something. But in reality, in the greatest reality of all, Jesus Christ, he who knew no sin, was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, is what the scriptures say. 2 uh, Corinthians 5:21 or 17. Um, and uh, so the new birth, the simplest form of Christianity, the beginning of what it's all about, <laughs> is totally dependent on the reality that somehow Jesus died a death for you and imparted to you new. Now, when I say new, according to this reality, according to God's Word, I mean new. New birth. New. New birth. Not, not um, again, and we, we discussed that a little bit with uh, Nicodemus. He said, okay, I, okay, I can, I can uh, appreciate the concept of, uh, of birth. But I'm having a hard time seeing how I am going to be able to get back in that womb and come back out again. And Jesus said, no way. No, 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 no. That's not the way it's going to happen. Uh, he said, how can I enter, and enter the second time, you know, into his mother, the second time. Him, the second time. And Jesus said, no, no, that's not what it is. Uh, that which is born, born of the flesh is flesh. And it is, if it's born flesh, it is flesh until it dies. This death. This death. Not just any death. This death. The de even the death of the cross. It is flesh. That which is born flesh, flesh. There's no arguing with that. I mean, Jesus' theology is very simple. You know what I mean? I mean, we make it all real difficult. But his theology is very simple. Were you born in the flesh? Yeah, I sure was. Your flesh. Now you have to be born of the Spirit. But there ain't no born of the Spirit till there's death to the flesh. Then there's resurrection into newness of life. Newness of life. Romans 6, 3, if I'm not mistaken. If you have been, if, 
and there's that conditionalism. If you have been planted together, together, not some little death you died, together in the likeness of his death, you shall be in the likeness of H-I-S, his, his resurrection. Newness of life. Not you getting a new life. Newness of life. It, it's new. It's not you again. Like Nicodemus said, how can I a second time? And Jesus said, you can't a second time. It's not you again. What is the hope of glory? Christ in you. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. He didn't say Jesus in other places. He said Jesus died for me, but that's not the only truth of the cross. He said, I am crucified. Not just Jesus died somehow and I believe that and that's enough. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live because you see me, but it is not I, not I. And boy, that's the heart of the matter right there. The I that you and I struggle with has been taken care of. The I that we struggle with, the I that we are trying to wrestle to the ground, the I that we're trying to bring into subjection, the ego, the id, whatever terminology you want to use, the I, the self, that which is self-centered or that which is flesh, we are trying to sanctify. But that which is flesh, as far as in God's eyes, is flesh. See, he sees flesh is flesh. We see flesh, and we put a, a robe on it and a little collar and put a prayer book in his hand, and we ordain it, and we say, now it's not flesh. And <clears throat> Jesus says, that which is flesh is flesh. And that he can't change his mind. He won't, not just because he's mean, but because he's already he has already come up with a remedy called Christ and him crucified. Why would he turn his back on the death of his son? Why would he turn his back on the new? Why would he reject it just because you and I are ignorant of it? Know ye not? Paul said. Know ye not? He says, as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into death. Don't you know that when Jesus died, you died? He's saying, he's not saying, don't you know that you need to die? He's saying, you seem to be ignorant, know ye not. You seem to be ignorant of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's talking to the church of Rome. He's saying you're ignorant of the death. What is it that makes you a believer? What is it? You know what I'm saying? Belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Okay. Okay. Now we get down to the heart of it. Do we believe in the historical fact that somehow is efficacious to us today, meaning having power today? Well, yeah, of course we believe that. But, my Lord, we have received something that is so much more real and more powerful. But look at the church. You know, look at the church. And you, you don't, you, where's the witness that is Christ? Where is the testimony of God that he hath declared concerning his son? His son is king of kings and lord of lords to the father. <laughs> his son reigns supreme and we don't yet see it all under his feet, but God never has worked by sight first. He never has. He never, uh, by the way, your father, God, your father has never gone by sight. He just, he doesn't do that. He never has. He made this stuff that you could see, but long before you could see things was the spirit world. And he is spirit. God is spirit. And they that truly worship him or bring him honor won't do it through the sense realm. This is where you get into works. And this is where you get into legalism. And this is where you get into... Uh, the, the foolishness of, uh, of thinking that if I put this thing up when I get through instead of leaving it here, God will love me more for that deed. Love me more. Now, that's not the way God is at all. His, it, it's like, you know, uh, 
God really loves you because of your, you know, your IQ. Is that a factor? Is that a factor? Is that one of the things that calls forth the love of God? I don't think so. But you see what I'm saying? We, we're basing love on factors that don't, you know, apples and oranges. We're basing it on foolishness. God's love is not like our love because God is love. To understand God is to understand love, but not usually the, you know, sloppy agape, the, the cheesy love that we, we think love is. I'm talking about total commitment. I'm talking about total self-giving on the part of God. See, we always say that. Well, you know, love is self-giving. God is the only one who, he is that, and he's the only one that's really fully given himself, by the way. <laughs> I mean, he's committed. He's committed to you. He's committed. And, and, the, and the reason why we don't think that he's committed is because we have not seen this yet. So we're going, how can God accept the big I and all of the yuck that is in there in the multi multiplicity of manifestations, you know, the, the multitude of ways that this nature comes out in attitudes, in actions, in, you know, uh, revenge and you know a multitude of things and we're and so we're we're right here we're in the sense realm we're looking right here we walk by sight not by faith according to the unengrafted word you know according to the letter that has no not written on the tables of our heart but is over here strictly to condemn us primarily or if we should do a, if I should put that riddle over there, to justify me. To justify me. When in reality, and I'm justified right here, but I'm totally ignorant of that. Really, in a real way. Now, I don't mean, I mean, everybody here could write a five-page essay on the point, but the point is not well taken with God unless it has, uh, you have entered in, he says, in into the Holy of Holies through a new and living way. Living new, you know, new. See? And if it's new, that's the old is gone. The old, that is what is so cool about this. If you have new birth, the old is gone. <laughs> now, if it's gone then, why am I having these problems? Part of the reason is and Paul put his finger on it. No, you're not. Don't you know? Don't, don't you know the cross? Don't you know what Christ accomplished? And we say, oh, yeah. Yeah, Jesus died for me. You know, we can say all the right words. But the truth is, the truth is, even if we say all the right words and we don't know it and we mess up, it does not change that this is done and you have a new birth. You have a new father. You have a new, you know. See, a birth made God now your father. Your father. You know. A uh, child, child does something wrong. You say, I don't like that act that you did. My love for you has not changed one iota out of this whole deal. But we need to talk about this act here because if, if you continue to do deeds like that, it can really get you off. But just in case you didn't know it, I totally love you. And if I raise my voice, it is not in any manner meant to show you or make you feel that you're not loved because the truth is I'm correcting you because I love you. But I'm not correcting you on this that you see, I'm trying to, buy, and his correction primarily would be to bring us into what is, not trying to correct something that could never correct. Flesh is flesh. Oh, gee. Flesh acted like flesh. God's going, I'm so disappointed. Jesus didn't way back 2,000 years ago walk around looking at him. He goes, that which is flesh is flesh. And, and we go, 
That's not deep enough. Say, give me something deep. Give me something spiritual. It's plenty plain and it's plenty powerful enough. Flesh is flesh. So uh, let me read a little more here because I don't want to read two sentences and then be done here. <clears throat> we make being born again anything but a birth. We don't know. We've been birthed, which means we have a father. We're in the family, and we do deeds that are wrong, and he corrects us because he loves us. All correction means to us we are failures. All correction, not to us, that's not the truth, but that's what we believe. And if I get corrected, and I don't, God forbid that I ever be corrected, so even in correction, I must either justify or make it look like that I didn't really do wrong or, or, or even take it in such a manner that I will be loved because I took it properly, which is not a factor at all. His love is just his love. You know, we go, okay, well, if I take this really good, then you'll still like me or whatever. You know, we run, we run because we're ignorant on our philosophies have been, you know, uh, have been built up in our mind, and they are vain. And Paul dealt with this over in Colossians, man. I mean, he, he gets into it, and he says, and after the vain deceit and after philosophies of men, and not after Christ. You need to be everything built on Christ. I mean, and, and yes, what a wonderful thing to know the cross and to know Christ and Him crucified because it overshadows everything, all philosophies. It will eventually... It, 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 uh, when the Spirit of God begins to break forth the truth, it is like darkness of philosophies, light is turned on. It is, he, he overshadows it. He, because He is the fullness of all truth. Everything else is but a shadow. It's, it's not, it has no, a shadow has no life. It is animated by the life that's over here, but to follow the shadow is ridiculous. And is, and, and is to only know like through a glass darkly. Okay, well, are you born again? Yeah, you're a child of God. Well, do you at least know someone? Yeah, you know someone. But I, the biggest sin I see about the whole thing is that you, just, you end up living like this, wrestling with this. Always caught up in this. And when I say the biggest sin, I, let me say the biggest crime for you. It's a crime for... It's a shame for you. It's sad for you because you have new birth. And we all say, yeah, I got new birth. You know, now what? Now what? You know. Uh, new birth came as a result of death of him, resurrection, Christ in you, new relationship with the Father based on family, love. Now what? There is no other foundation that can be laid than Jesus Christ and, and being born again. Yeah, and that's kind of like uh, a person that is uh, not born again, and he hears the message of the cross, and, and over here is the tree, in his mind, the tree of good, and over here is the tree of evil, and so he goes, okay, so I need to be good, and I need to follow this, so I'm going to follow the tree of good, and I'm going to stay away from the tree of evil, and the truth is, he might even be able to in one sense, but in reality, there is no tree of good, and then tree of evil. There's only the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Conjunction. And is a conjunction. Tying them together. Good and evil are here. And the only other tree mentioned is this. Is, is the tree that Peter talks about. He calls it the tree. The cross. He calls the tree. And it is a place to partake. 
It is a place to partake, not just to go up and say, oh, I believe in that. You know, now help me, you know, being like this, being like this nature, you know. Now help me. Come on, I'm, I'm looking. You know, that brass serpent on the pole that it talks about right here in this chapter, verse 14, as Moses lifted up, that was the judgment, past tense, of that evil nature, brass representing judgment, the serpent representing the enemy, and the judgment passed. And if you look on that and believe here, healing came in the Old Testament, salvation in the New. But we don't ever see the, the judgment having been carried out by Christ and the cross and, and a legal work finished and a, you know, so that we can rejoice. Jesus could say it's finished and we could say it's finished and, and, and believe and rejoice in the truth. And we, we're always, now, you know, there's a, there's a pressing to know the Lord, but there's not, you know, I mean, the cross becomes a reality that is ever present. A reality that is ever present. But if a person doesn't know that, even if he's born again, he will primarily feel all of the same desires. I mean, you put him in a, or her in a situation that will stir up certain things, and that which is flesh is flesh, you know, until this cross, until... You know, Jerry said something a long time ago, and I, I, I might have said it first, but I heard it from him, and it sounded better than if I said it. But uh, he said that God doesn't want us to believe these, the cross. He wants us to identify with it. I mean, that I'm, I died, not that I need to die, or I died, now what am I going to do with these problems? You know, but to believe... Or identify now. Identification is the way. You know, I am Paul said, I am crucified. I, I mean, you, you don't get any more identified than I am. Uh, in the Greek, a past finished, and you're studying that. Check it out. The the uh, whatever it is, I don't even remember. Uh, a past finished work having present results. Ah, man, that's powerful. A past finished, past finished, having present. Now that's what I want. Something so powerful that it is reverberating through all creation, all ages. And that's the cross. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. And it, and it full, the fullness of time. And it fills up all time. Past finished. I like that. So I can I can grab hold of that and go, okay, man. You know, now that doesn't mean that truth won't be challenged by the flesh who that will say things contrary to that. But is that not what faith is? Is to believe the word of God? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, to believe God's word above whatever. Whatever. And we will all say amen to that one. Yes. You know? And yet, the first sign of anything in our flesh or in, you know, that, that says, look at this, we drop our eyes of faith from our spirit and we look with these eyes and, you know, and somebody, I'll tell you what, one of the biggest uh, pulls on me is that when I was first learning this, somebody would come along and preach, you know, oh, you know, they would preach in such a manner that would make me drop my eyes, and maybe they didn't do it, or maybe I just did it, but they would preach in such a manner that I would drop my eyes and start working again, and then realize how I, you have left the cross. You've left the way. You've left the answer. You can't get to the answer this way. You know, and, and down motivation instead of through the cross. So, let me read a little more. Many today speak of the new birth as not a new birth at all, but just us stopping doing certain deeds. So you got this guy and you say, okay, these are bad deeds over here. Don't do those. Okay? Here's some good deeds. Praying, going to church, reading your Bible, tithing. Do those. Okay? You got it. 
That's it. No, that isn't it. That's not it. That's not it. Because even if you do that, you're, you're still doing good and not by Christ. You're not doing it through the cross. You're, well, let me read because I'm sure my notes will clean it up a little more. Uh, many days speak of the new birth is not new birth at all, but just us stopping doing certain deeds and the doing of other deeds. We make it a change of actions or a deliverance from hell or a deliverance, uh, a healing from sickness or freedom from alcoholism. But that, none of that is Christ and Him crucified. None of that. None of that. You say, well, does it, it result in that? Well, okay, I don't have a problem with that, but don't put the emphasis. You know, the deal I've often said to people, you know, we go out and we witness and we say, okay, now you need to quit smoking and stuff and come over here and receive Jesus, you know. And I always say we try to clean the fish before we catch it. That's ridiculous, you know. <laughs> you know, it's, you know uh, I think you need to catch it before you can clean it. And if it ain't on the hook and if it don't belong to Jesus, you ain't going to be able to clean it. There's no way. Uh -huh. That's right. Instead of believing, and, 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 in, and specifically believing what? Not just a historical fact, folks. Not just a historical fact. Believing is identifying with Christ and Him crucified. Now, now, if you don't agree with that, I challenge you to check out Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. Particularly Romans 6. Galatians 2.20. Um, Ephesians. You know, most of Ephesians. Colossians. Philippians. So we get all wrapped up in doing of things. We stop smoking and drinking and start praising and praying. <clears throat> the new birth is a change of life, not a change of actions, though actions will come as a result of the exchanged life. At the cross, you know, it's like the pearly gates. <clears throat> Give me your old life. Here's your new one. Your old was you. Your new one is Christ. The old is flesh. The new one is spirit. The new life is spirit. If we're not living based on spirit realm or spirit, then we're living by flesh, which is sense realm. I mean... The flesh tends toward this. I'm telling you. You know, I know you don't realize this, but the flesh tends toward what it sees, feels, tastes, and touch. That which is flesh is flesh. You'll never, you know, convert it. In fact, I, I'm sure I got more on that. But, you know, and that's what we try to do is we try to convert the flesh. <laughs> you don't convert your flesh. You say, well, what is conversion? Conversion is converting your will, not your flesh. Your flesh cannot be converted. Of course, we get into all that, those differences in Bible doctrines class where we talk about the difference between reconciliation and regeneration and redemption and, and uh, conversion and all those things. <clears throat> okay, but it was not Nicodemus getting in the womb and him coming out again. Not Nicodemus again, not another birth, definitely not a second birth, but a new birth. It is not a thing of us at all. It is the birth of the incorruptible seed. And this is... Uh, 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is like grass, and the glory of man like the flower. The, the, the flesh, the, the, the flower fadeth, the grass withereth, but the word of the Lord endures forever. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, God's reality, that, doesn't, that this one changes up and down, up and down, up and down. This one with emotions and 
viewpoints and thoughts changes up and down, up and down. This one is steady. Man, if, if you just, you know, get on the rock. <laughs> you know, if you just get on the rock. It's the Word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not. And, and so he says, so he says, okay, man, if you're being born again of incorruptible seed, the new, which liveth and abideth, not, not up and down, not here one day and gone the next, liveth, E-T-H, uh, in the King James means a continuing process. Liveth. We always just thought it was King James the way he speaketh. But he doesn't use it after everyone. He only uses it to show a continuing process. And this word, or, or this, this seed, liveth and is, if you will, I'm going to put it this way, is watered, is fed by the word of God because this testifies of what is. This, this is used as water for the seed, or you could say it is a mirror whereby, the, James says, we look into this mirror, and instead of seeing us and our flesh, for that would be seeing the law that points this pointing out your wrong deeds, and you going, oh, I'm bad, it reveals Christ, it tells what you are in him. If you're not identified in him, then you're condemned by him. In fact, the third chapter, Jesus said, and this is the, you know, like the Son of Man didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world by, might be saved. But this is the condemnation, that light has come, and you loved your deeds ra rather than coming to the light. Well, I'm coming to the light. I'm identifying with the light. I'm in him because he did this. But of God, 1 Corinthians um, uh, 1 verse 29 of God are you in Christ not me I didn't do something special of God my father am I in Christ Jesus who is made unto me wisdom righteousness sanctification and redemption so that he did that so that he that glorieth the flesh is going to glory in the flesh but he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord you, you see when when you are identified in Christ, you have a new identity. You, you, you're not what you were. You are a new, here we go, creation. You're a new creation. We lucked out picking that name. Or did we know what we were talking about? Did we know that we are new? And the new is not the old. Oh, that I could get away from the old. But you are through Christ and, the cru and him crucified. Through Christ. Not, not anything about... You don't take Christ out of the cross. Don't try to go to the cross. Don't see the cross as something separate from what Jesus did. Know ye not that as many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Like as he was raised from the dead, so we walk in newness of life. You're identified in him. You are known in him. You learn to not know yourself any other way but the way God's word declares you. But the, the scriptures come down hard. Uh, I was reading in um, Revelation chapter 21. And uh, uh, I had just been in Exodus doing a study there. And uh, the Holy Spirit is, um, he really does have a sense of humor, I believe. I'm just, it's just, you know, funny sometimes what he does. But he led me over there in Revelation chapter, chapter 21, I forget which verse. Um, he says, but the, but the doubting and the unbelieving and all liars and murderers and adulterers, they are going to have their place in the lake of fire. And the first thing I noticed was that uh, he, he kind of, you know, he had these really bad characters, you know, murderers and adulterers and all this stuff, you know, scum of the earth. And then he had us little white liars and us little, well, I just have fears. Oh, I, d I doubt sometimes. He said, 
the fearful and the doubting, all liars, da 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 shall have their place in the lake of fire. So, now I don't know about you, but if you're not identified in Christ, you go, man, oh man, I'm going to fry forever. Because <laughs> I have doubts, and I have fears, and I've even lied before. And then there was that guy murdered last month. You know? Did you have a comment there? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Yeah, Galatians 6 uh, is... Uh, where he's talking about being crucified unto the world and the world unto me. Well, it was funny, though. It talked about the fearful and the doubting, the unbelieving. And I had just been reading in Exodus, which is a type of, these things were done to them for examples to us, and they happened to them for our admonition upon whom, that here they are in Egypt, and... God, through the death of the Lamb and through the blood, brings them out, right? Or, or, you know, saves them from the death angel and brings them to the edge of Egypt, ready to go out. And there's a mountain on one side, a mountain on the other side, the Red Sea in front of them, and Pharaoh's armies bearing down on them, and they're trapped. Now, they're, they, they've, they've killed the lamb, or, or they, in other words, they've, they've acknowledged the death of the lamb. They've identified with the blood, put it on their doorpost in a very practical way. But they're standing there doubting and fearing and shaking in their boots. And I'm going, kill them, Lord, kill them. You know, like you said in Revelation. Well, no, I really didn't do that, but I, I'm just, I'm trying to make a point here. You know, like you, did, like you said in Revelation 21, they doubted, don't break. But he brought them out, and he covered them, and he led them, and he continually ministered to their needs. And their clothes never grew old, and their shoes never wore out. I mean, <laughs> you know, and that was in the wilderness, <laughs> you know. And he's going, this isn't even what I really got in mind. I mean, I know you guys are excited about the miracles and all that's going on, but, man, I got a land, a stable place that flows. And uh, so he's, he's, this is just the beginning. But, and then I thought, I started going through how many times, you know, I mean, you're looking there at uh, Gideon, and he's hiding, and he's, hiding corn and he's afraid and all this stuff and the angel of the Lord walks up and says you know hail thou mighty man of valor and he's he's a chicken he's scared and he goes you talking about me he goes yeah you 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 mighty man of valor and he goes well, you know and he go and he goes God is with you and you know what he said well if God is with me where's all the miracles he used to do Oh, oh, he has to be with you in miracles. What is a miracle? The manifestation of God in the sense realm. You're already a mighty man of valor because you have the new birth. You are a new creation. This is God, this is God's eyes. This is this is God's viewpoint. This isn't yours, obviously, right? This is God's view of you. If any man, Greek word mankind there, not man of the male type, but mankind. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, Look at it. All things, are, when you look at it like here, but you know where we look? We go, well, okay, old has passed away and the new has come. Cool. And then 
we get disappointed. He said, Behold, all things are passed away. Behold, all things, all things are become new, and all things are of God. Well, now, come on, let's get real. You look at you, you look at your circumstances. Is all things of God? Is it all new, the way you act? No. And he must not have been talking about you in your sense realm reality, but right here. And he, that is what he's talking about, I can assure you. Because uh, if you'll check the chapter there, that's the whole point. Yep. And if we, are, if we see that, and this is why the scriptures say, know ye not, or knowing this, knowing this, that the old man is, that we must, uh, that we will be transformed by the renewing, I-N-G, the renewing. We must keep the word of God before our eyes. We must keep it either by the scriptures which probably won't be enough, by teachers who will tell you, by brothers or sisters that are going to be faithful to the truth. As much as they know to be, they, the truth, they bought the truth, and they're not going to sell it. You know what I mean? I don't mean physical money. I mean, they, they, this is it. They, this is what they've sold out to and, and so they will be faithful to tell. And, and so, uh, and, and certain books or, or, or tapes or things will come your way. And so you begin to fill up. Fill up. And you walk in that for a period of time. You're being marinated by the Holy Spirit. You're soaking, you're, you're, you're just, it's getting inside of you, you know? You've been soaking for a long time. And what is soaking? I mean, if you marinated something, you know, and you soaked it in there, what does it do? It soaks for a long time with the purpose of getting inside of it, not just, you know, slapping it on there so that it has the flavor and you can lick it off and go, well, that's gone. You're not being barbecued. That comes if you don't accept this. <laughs> but God, as he says in the scriptures, but God has a better thing for you. He wants to marinate you, not barbecue you. Amen. Jerry? Tenderizes. Yes, it does. Amen. Good point. Yes? Right. 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 That's that's right. <clears throat> All right. Let me see if I can read just a little more before we take a break here. So not Nicodemus again, not another birth, definitely not a second birth, but a new birth. It is not a thing of us at all. It is the birth of the incorruptible seed. The birth that Mary, the mother of Jesus, the birth that Mary experienced wasn't of her coming forth more spiritual. It was Christ. Now the birth of Jesus was upon this wise, it says in Matthew. And there it describes the physical things, but it is talking about new birth. The old head, the, the real head, the real father, the real life giver was God. But the old head was Joseph, representing the carnal mind. 
not being minded, nice guy, not being minded to make a spectacle. He was going to put her away privately, put her away. When this is the one who is, you finally get one that brings forth Christ, and he's going to put her away. You know, <clears throat> because it looks funny to everybody. It doesn't, you know, well, it was, it was Christ that came forth. Though. It wasn't Mary getting better. It wasn't Mary more spiritual. It is the seed of God, not us. And this is where we have such a hard time, folks. We're trying to be the seed of God. We're trying to be Christ. That which is flesh is flesh. That's you. That which is spirit is spirit. That's him. He can live his life in you. This is the hope of glory. Christ in you. This is it. Okay? And we're trying to be the seed of God, and we are not the seed of God. We are the container. We're the flower pot, but we're not the seed of God. And, and people get into deception. Then they teach this in such a manner, they leave Jesus out of it, and they become the seed of God. <clears throat> uh, first of all, you, you... I mean, it's bad enough to mess up and be in the flesh. It's worse to pervert it and call Jesus you. Or vice versa, you know. Um, it is not me increasing, but decreasing with his increase. Before there can be a new birth, the old birth in Adam must be put to death. That's called the cross. Just to mention a new birth demands you come face to face with the death of the old creation. It, it demands it. To be born again was not an experience that happened to you. Maybe you had a salvation experience, but to be born again was not an experience that happened to you except in Christ as he did this. This is what you must see about new birth. And you must come face to face with death, the death of the old, old creation. Excuse me. Jesus finds it necessary to point this out. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. No amount of education. You see his flesh here? See, it, it, that which is flesh is flesh. Jesus looks at it. I mean, it, see, this is not complicated to God. He goes, that which is flesh is flesh. Oh, well, I'll, I'll educate myself. I'll, you know, what I, what I, I write here, let's see. No amount of information. Oh, I'll get more information. Cultivation. Well, I'll, I'll take some charm classes. You know, morality, church attendance. None of those things can change that which is flesh is still flesh. There must be a death. Thank God for the cross. But with the death, there is a resurrection unto, not just a resurrection, unto newness of life so that you could understand by that Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Unto newness, if it's new, it's not us again. It is something new that you didn't have before, and it's called Jesus. And you have that now. Now you have to possess it. It's yours every place you put your foot. Start walking it. Know what you got. You know, if, if there was a, a, a plot of land, let's say right back over here, and this building wasn't over here, and it was just a field, and we bought it, we signed the deed for it, it's ours. But if it's overgrown and got weeds and all this stuff, if we don't go over there and possess it and clean it up, it's still pretty messed up. But it's, it's still ours. It may need possessing. It may need inhabiting. But it is still ours. When you know who you belong to, <laughs> it, will, it will help you. <laughs> it will help you a lot. When you know, but when you don't know who you belong to, that opens the door for fear and for doubt and for guilt and for running away and for, you understand? I look at myself as that field and I say, okay, you bought me, you purchased me, now you clean me up. I don't do that in a smart aleck way. In fact, I do it in a very trusting way. But I also do it in a, in a submission way. Listen to the submission. You bought me, you clean me up. Anybody catch submission in there? This is a full-fledged submission. 
You're, it, that's your area of responsibility. I will not foolishly start delving in there, weed-eating myself. You know, I mean, that is a full-fledged submission, but it may not sound like, you know, somebody else is over here going, Oh, Jesus, just help me, help me, help. And they sound humble, don't they? Oh, I just, I just need you. But they're not submitting themselves to the fact that he's bought it and trusting that he's going to clean them up and da-da-da. They're not submitting to that at all. They're not humble at all. They're being prideful because they're not accepting the truth. They're not accepting the truth. But they sound humble and they look humble. Another person says, Hey, you bought me, you clean me up. And that may be more humility than you've ever seen in your life because it is a full recognition of, of his authority as Lord. And it is a full uh, uh, a declaration. I do not cross lines of authority as if I am the incorruptible seed or as if I were given the ability to do something here. You are my Lord, and I trust that. But you look and you go... Look at that. He's got his finger pointing up and saying, you, you know, there's, he's not humble. And God may be going, that's what I want right there. He's humbling himself, and I'm going to exalt him. And this other one's over here going, oh, you know, Lord, I just can't do it. You just, you know, come on. You know, it's kind of like, I don't want to see the cross or believe anything there. I mean... Come on! There's no humility there. There's no submission there. There's not. There's not. There's no submission there. That is pride. That exalts, it is a high thing. A high thing that is exalting itself against God's way. God's truth. God's life, God's plan, Jesus' death, the Holy Spirit's arrival and His purpose. It is, it is choosing religion. You remember, you remember Jesus? Now, Jesus is the one who gave us this example. Uh, but we misread it. He said, two people went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and one was a publican. Pharisee went in there and lifted up his head and said, God, you know that I don't do this and I don't do that and I, don't, I, I tithe and I've been doing real good and everything. Sounds like he's really submitted. And the other one goes in and he says, he even, doesn't even lift his head, so we think because he doesn't lift his head, he's humble. We, 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 see, we're, everything's outward appearance to us. But he says this, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. So we stand before the Lord and we go, oh, we ignore them. We say, Lord, be merciful. Help me, God. I mean it. I mean it. You know? And we carry on and on thinking that if we cry and carry on, that God's going to go, oh, okay. You finally cried enough and wallowed, you know? You really wallow well. So I'm going to respond. No. When that man said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, he used a particular Greek word. And those of you, you know, I really like this Greek class because it really, you know, you check, you're check. supposed to check this stuff out, and I give you a lot of stuff from the Greek. He used the word for mercy, which is the word mercy seat or the place where the blood was sprinkled so that God found acceptance. Isn't that cool? He says, Lord, be merciful to me based on the mercy seat, the death of the Lamb, your acceptance of the blood. Look at me the way you would at Jesus on the cross. Isn't that cool? It is uh, humbling himself to the way, to the truth, to the lie. It is full submission to God's reality. The other guy's not even bringing in God's reality. Hey, I know I'm accepted. Because I tithe and I've been doing good. And, and Jesus said, which one was more justified? And the answer was the publican. Because he's not justified by works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he's standing before God now practicing it, guess what? 
When he dies and stands before the Lord, do you think it's going to be hard for him to come up with the right answer? Come on, listen to me. Do you think he's practicing it right now, the, 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 the publican? When he gets in a bad situation, when he gets, he's practicing the truth. He's, he's believing and putting it into work and standing on it and saying, man, th that lamb died and shed his blood and that blood you found acceptable and when it's sprinkled, that's good enough for you and that's as if I died. I lay my hands on that lamb, identify with it, and it dies and that's good, as good as my death. And I accept that. Well, well, you get in the habit of doing that. You get put in the press. You get put in bad situations. You come under accusation, and you keep coming up with the, the mercy seat. Then when you die and stand before God, can you imagine standing before almighty God, pure holiness, pure everything? I mean, I think I would choke up if I didn't know the truth. You know what I'm saying? I think I would choke up. I just got a feeling that I would just go, <laughs> you know. And some are going to go, because they're so full of pride, they're not going to have that kind of fear or that kind of awe. They're going to go, Lord, didn't we do mighty things? Didn't we cast out them? Remember when I did this? Remember when I did that? Woo, Lord! And he's going to go, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I tithe. I did this. I did that. And he's going to go, we're talking justification here. I, you should have said, look at me like you do when you look at the mercy seat. But the reason why you didn't say that, old buddy, is, and then God will play his life back and says, remember when you got in this situation right here on this linear line? You referred to your works. And you did bad. Your works were bad, and so you felt bad. And so you worked real hard to do certain things that, so that you felt like you'd done enough that I was appeased, not propitiated. This is the word propitiation, but appeased. You, I, I did a, you know, you thought you did enough things that I'd probably let you up by now and accept you back. So you started acting like it, which I'd accepted you all along based on this. You started acting like it again, and your faith rose, but it didn't rise based on the truth. It rose based on thinking that you had appeased me. But then you messed up again. No, no, no. Then you did good for a while, and you felt really good, and you walked with a real, you know, your, your countenance, and boy, I'm doing good, and boy, isn't God wonderful? You know, and then you failed, and oh, oh. I had a guy uh, talking to Des, listening, and he says, we think that God renegotiates our relationship every time we discover some new failure in our life, as if he just discovered it too. He's God. He knew it. He's, he's always, and he loved you. You know, when you, when you were ignorant of it, let's say you're ignorant of this big bad thing you're going to find out right here. Ignorant, and, and God's with you, and he loves you, and he blesses you, and, you know, he shows you stuff in the Word, and then all of a sudden you become aware of this. And then you, you, you don't have faith that God's for you and you don't think that, you know, you think the, he, the whole relationship has got to be renegotiated. The whole relationship, which we don't have one based on this. We have one based on whatever's going on at the time. And so we can't see anything in the Word because even if we read it, we're full of guilt because our, we haven't been propitiated. We're full of guilt. So all we can see is condemnation. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. And and so, but eventually, once again, through our works or whatever, we go. We get we get to feeling so bad that we decide we're going to do some good stuff for a while. And this is a um, <clears throat> an, a, 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 a a pattern of addiction. My uh, stepfather, well, my my mother and stepfather both were alcoholics, and. And, man, he'd get drunk, and, I mean, he would just, oh, God. You, i can tell you some stories of some junk that he did that would just, oh, God, stuff he did. But then, you know, he'd do some really bad stuff, and then he'd turn around after about a couple of days, and he would do some nice things for a while. And once he did those nice things and everybody was, you know, acting nice to him again and we're all just glad he's doing something nice and hoping this will last. 
uh, then he feels good and he gets to feeling good enough that he can do something bad again. You know? But he always had that pattern of addiction is he always had to come back and do some good for a while because you, get, you feel real guilty for the bad. And so now you've got to do good. Okay? It's, it never looks to Jesus. It never looks to the cross. It never lives in relationship. I mean relationship. You, do you know what? I'm talking about a relationship with this reality that is the Lord, the cross. You know? Take up your cross daily. You know, growing in the fullness of all of this. And relating, let, let's put it this way, relating to God on the basis of how he has established a relationship with us. Is that okay? Is that a good way of putting it? But we don't relate to God our Father that way. We don't even relate to him as a birth, as a true father. We really relate to him as a judge. When we get in trouble, we don't go to our Father and go, I messed up, I need some help. We go to the judge and the, we're going there with one thing, and this is the prodigal son, one thing in mind, I've sinned, I've messed up, I really need to make this right. Uh, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with a love relationship. It has everything to do with clearing up, you know, you're the judge and I'm the, I'm the, the, the criminal here, and we need to clear all this up. And the father runs and kisses him, doesn't even work on the clearing up of the stuff because there are bigger issues in the heart of the father bigger and they're not bigger to us but they're bigger to him and they are bigger because he's God but bigger and he runs and he throws his arm around and he kisses him because that's his heart he hasn't even repented yet because that's his heart As for, you know just because we don't acknowledge this doesn't mean he don't <laughs> and that's the cool thing I learned just because, because there was a period that I went to all this, just because I didn't acknowledge it didn't mean he didn't live his life according to it. He does. And that was so cool when I found that out, that he never changed, that he's stable, that my relationship is stable with him. And I wrote down today, it really hit me. It was so cool. And I'll, I'll close, gosh. But I'll, this, is, this is just good. This thing of new beginning, it hit me. See, I, I'm, I, lo I teach you stuff. And then it takes me six months to a year to find out what you think I said. And I just found out one. <laughs> what you've been thinking all this time. I talk about, you know, going along with the Lord, and then boom, we do something wrong, and I say, get a new beginning. And what we think is, is that we have to, that g there has to be a start with God. God has to start over. Like, like, well, we, you know, we've got to go back and rebuild this relationship and get in good with God. But here's the way it is. God is like, and it all relates to this. So what I'm going to draw really relates to this reality. But it's like a great river. There is a river that satisfies the, the heart of God. Look, thank you, this well good. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <coughs> There's a river. And we're in this river and we're flowing with God, you know, and when you're flowing with God, it's nice, isn't it? Isn't it good? Everything's happening, man. I mean, because it's just, it's just the way it's supposed to be, man. You know, and even when you hit white water, woo, you know, you, you go woo. You don't go, ah, you know, when you're flowing with God. But then what we do is we get out of that. We get over here in the sense realm and in the flesh, okay? Now this river just keeps on flowing and flowing and flowing. But we get off. So if we get a new beginning, what we're doing is we are, all we're doing is reestablishing the reality of this that's always there. In other words, we're saying this, uh, uh, I go back to the thing that I've always had a relationship with him based on these truths. I don't leave that, or I, I left it, but I return to it. It's not like he has to reestablish and rework and go, I don't know, man, you know. I'm, I, I need a new beginning here, and okay, well, I'll, I'll work with you on this. He just, you know, you walk up, and he goes, hey, he hugs you and everything, you know, and it's just like nothing ever ceased, and it's flowing, and, you know, and you're swept away with the Lord, and you're going, whoa, you know, and it's always that way with him. He, he never changes because the cross never changes. 
But if this is not our view of God, if we have another view of God, like, well, he's mad and he's upset and you've got to do this and to get a new beginning, you've got to appease him and you've got to bring him to a certain temperament and you've got to bring you to a certain place and you've got to do all this. And a new beginning means a whole lot of work to you and a whole lot of figuring and dealing and whatever. A new beginning to God means forget the old things that you got off on, going by side over here and feeling sorry for yourself and, and go, letting the devil tell you something and, you know, going by that and step right back in the water and, whoo, you're carried again. It's all there. No, you don't let up one bit. It's as if you never left the river. With him, it's, it's not a new beginning for him. It's always for him. It's new for you. Do you see that? You know, there is no renegotiation going on here to get something new. You know, I've got to rework my contract to see if God will hold me over for another season. You know, it's not like that at all. The contract was settled in the blood of Jesus that started this flow. And the covenant is sound. And all you've got to do is, is move back by faith back to what was and what you believed and you'll find that he continued to believe it, and you'll flow. Does that make any sense? Oh, I really need to stop because it's getting late. Remember your thoughts, and when we come back, we'll talk about it.